trade deadline. Next, former Vice President Dan Quayle. At a news conference in Phoenix today, he expressed his intention to no longer seek the Republican presidential nomination. After his announcement, he answered a few questions from reporters. The event's about 20 minutes. Well, thank you all uh, for coming this morning. First, let me begin by uh, thanking my incredible family. My wife, Marilyn, who's been my best friend, my political strategist, uh, the person that's been closest to me ever since uh, we've been married, which will be 27 years uh, this November. My three children, Tucker, Benjamin and Corinne, who have made uh, sacrifices that many would never know about. And I thank them and I love them dearly and deeply. I want to thank my incredible staff, loyal, dedicated, hardworking, committed, Kyle McSlarrow, who has been the campaign manager. Two people who have been with me since my vice presidential days, John McConnell and Craig Whitney. I also want to thank the supporters and people around the country that have supported me and my campaign, supported the ideas that I've been fighting for, supporting the the cause of freedom, liberty, and justice. Today, our campaign is really in a rather unique position because the most recent national poll, the CNN Time poll, shows us in second place. Finally, beginning to emerge as the clear alternative to the front runner. So the polls are encouraging today. I just spent four or five days last week in New Hampshire. We've got an incredible organization in New Hampshire. Those of you that have been with me know exactly what I'm talking about. Former Governor John Sununu, probably the best politician in a generation to come out of that state. Ovid LaMontagne, who was the Republican gubernatorial candidate in 1996. Gordon McDonald, a great team, a great organization. And they told me that my last visit that we have, that we had an excellent chance of winning the New Hampshire primary. We would have had the resources financially to compete in Iowa and New Hampshire. But you need more than that. And this Republican primary is for presidency, for the presidency is, is unprecedented. Never before have we had a Republican primary like we are having today. The front runner apparently will have up to $100 million to spend in the Republican primary. And after New Hampshire, and this is a very important point, and it was very critical in my decision. There will be 18 primaries within 30 days of the New Hampshire primary. If I would win the New Hampshire primary, which I think I had a reasonable chance of doing, looking at the amount of money that I would have to raise and the calendar of these primaries, it became a very difficult proposition. There would be little time for reflection on what we had just achieved. There would not be sufficient time to raise the resources to be competitive in states like California, New York, Ohio, Michigan, major expensive states. And so reality set in. Thus. I was facing 
a campaign where the front runner would have up to $100 million to spend and an unprecedented front loading of the primary system made the task for me winning the nomination of my party virtually impossible. There's a time to stay and there's a time to fold. There's a time to know when to leave the stage. Thus, today, I am announcing that I will no longer be a candidate for President of the United States. A friend of mine that I spoke to last night gave me a quote from Winston Churchill that is rather appropriate for today. And it is this. Failure is not fatal. Success is not final. It is courage that counts. And even though I won't be a candidate, I still have the courage, the energy, and the dedication to fight for the ideas that I believe in. I have just finished writing my third book, Worth Fighting For. It is a composite of ideas that I believe in and I believe will unite the Republican Party. It'll be a good platform for the Republican Party. So what I will do now is to continue to fight for those ideas that I believe in, fight for the philosophy of a smaller, more effective government, lowering taxes, strengthening the American family, and reinvesting in our national defenses. Those are the ideas of the Republican Party as well. I am going to work to unite this party. I will support the nominee of the Republican Party. I want to see the Republicans recapture the White House. It is time that we restore honor, dignity, and decency to the Oval Office. So I will work with you and my fellow Americans to make this country even greater than it is today. I'm an optimist. Always have been, always will be. As Marilyn and I journey on to a different life at a different pace, we do it with our heads held high. I am proud of what I have accomplished. I'm proud of my family. I'm thankful for the opportunities that I have had to get my ideas out there, and I'm going to continue to fight for the, those ideas. And let me just say again thank you to my incredible family my wonderful staff, all my friends and supporters around America. Thank you for what you have done for me and for my family and what we've all done for our country. And I seriously doubt if this will be my last press conference. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
anybody saying how should we change this so we don't have a, a fait accompli back in, uh, in October, a year out? Well, as I, as I said, there, this Republican primary is uh, un unprecedented. And the fact that uh, the front runner apparently is going to have up to $100 million to spend and the, the front loading of the, of the primaries. Campaign finance reform, as you well know, does not address the, the front loading of, loading of the primaries. That's a party responsibility. Uh, the Democratic Party actually does it a little bit differently than the Republican Party, but it's a party responsibility. As far as the campaign finance reform, let me say I do not believe it is a good idea to have the taxpayers uh, finance campaigns. Uh, we don't need another entitlement program. We don't need more taxpayer subsidies uh, to various things. But I think there should be a serious consideration uh, given to uh, perhaps uh, looking at that thousand dollar limitation, uh, looking at ways that uh, we can in fact uh, make it uh, more accessible to those that have the ideas and have the, the message that needs to be able to get the, uh, the amount of money that's necessary to get that message out. And there are potential some reforms that we can, can look at. But I am not for uh, the taxpayer subsidy of, of campaigns. We do have a primary going on, but it is going to be extremely difficult to deny him the nomination. Uh, as you could tell from my remarks, I did not make an endorsement. I'm not making an endorsement today. I'm just uh, stating reality and uh, political facts. Mr. Quayle, along those lines, you said that you're standing for lower taxes, smaller government, national defense, and family values. Do you think you shares uh, those values? Well, I'm going to be working with whoever the Republicans select as our nominee and the, the party to make sure that those ideas are front and center. Because you do not uh, defeat either Al Gore or Bill Bradley by trying to be a duplicate of the Democratic Party. I believe that what you need to do is to, to be bold, uh, courageous, articulate in putting out ideas that are different. And if our party chooses the, the route that I have suggested, I am convinced that we will be victorious in November. If they resist that route, I think it's going to be far more problematic and more difficult. Because I am one of those that believes that ideas turn elections. Ideas make a difference. Why do you think people aren't voting today? Because they don't really see a real difference in the two parties. And they're saying it doesn't make a difference. I say it does make a difference. And that is our task and our job to make sure that the American people understand that there is a clear difference between the Republican nominee and the Democratic nominee. And I will work to make sure that happens. Well, let, let me just say that uh, I look forward to, to working with the, the nominee of our party. Uh, I'm going to work to, to unite the party, to bring the party together. I want to reach out to many of those that have left our party, uh, many of the people that have joined the Reform Party and to get them to to rethink the Republican Party. I think it's imperative that we do get them back into the Republican Party. I have a little history of this. In 1992, uh, Ross Perot did uh, serious damage uh, to our reelection uh, efforts. And so that is uh, my uh, challenge. And I uh, hope that the, uh, you know, the, the governor of, uh, of Texas, uh, should he be the nominee, which it looks like at this stage, uh, uh, would wholeheartedly in endorse uh, my ideas. I have no reason to think that he wouldn't. Uh, I think that he would be very supportive of of the things uh, that I have uh, that I have laid before the American people. Mr. Quayle, uh, to take a complete for Mr. Bush, any advice for Mr. McCain? Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I've just made one very tough decision this w this weekend, and I'll just have to wait and see what unfolds. I'm not going to indicate one way or another. I'm just not going to not prepare to do that today. Mr. Who? Oh. Well, I think any campaign is going to have to look at uh, the political realities, and, and that's what really 
brought me to where I am today. Now think of this, 18 primaries within 30 days after the New Hampshire primary. There is very little time for reflection. There is little time to gain the momentum that is necessary to get people convinced that you are the best candidate. And it's almost impossible to have the time available to go out and to raise the money to compete with $100 million. Because if you look at the calendar and the big expensive states that are right after the New Hampshire primary, it is virtually an impossible task. And this is a decision that obviously I didn't want to make. I'd like to have more money from individual contributors, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. As you continue your career of writing and speaking and serving on boards and the like, do you imagine ever running for one of I'm just uh, focused on this press conference. Uh, Marilyn and I will be uh, leaving uh, uh, later on this afternoon uh, to get a, take a few days off to reflect, um, to decompress, uh, to, to organize and reorganize uh, our lives. So I, I really haven't, I haven't given any thought beyond uh, the presidential campaign. Uh, I just have been so immersed in trying to win this nomination, uh, working as hard as I possibly can. And I can tell you, I've never worked harder for anything in my life. And obviously it's you know, a disappointment, but life goes on. And uh, I do it uh, in a, with a tone of optimism and I'm just a very proud of what I've been able to accomplish. I still consider myself reasonably young, though my children would probably disagree with that. 52 is not bad. Okay. I don't think we ought to write anyone out of the Republican Party. Let me just be very clear. I have always had this viewpoint. People that endorse me endorse my ideas. And so if he stays in the Republican Party, then he's going to endorse the ideas of the Republican Party and endorse the ideas of the Republican nominee. So yes, I want to see as many people as possible endorse those ideas. So I don't want them to want him to leave. And it's not vice versa. You know, to stay in the party and to support the nominee, he supports the Republican Party ideas. No, he's pro-life. He has said he's pro-life, and I take him at his word on that. Okay. <laughs> what, reconsider? <laughs> it's, it, it, it's a done deal. <laughs> done deal. Thank you all very much. Thank you.